Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 81 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Gavin, and that is Fia. Uh, happy 4th of July to our, you know, American listeners. We have we have a lot of international listeners, and I'm quite surprised at the variety of places that we're from. So. <laughs> yeah, me, um, me too. Ha- happy regular week to y'all. Uh, and yeah, happy 4th of July. Just, yeah. Some things have happened recently that makes me not so happy with this country. But, you know, that's life. Yeah. Occasionally. Um, go out and vote if that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, anywho, uh, Mike is still off adventuring this week. Uh, ideally, he'll give us another little snippet of what he has been up to. But I know he uh, had a very colorful uh outfit to wear today hiking on the 4th of july we're actually recording this on the 4th <laughs> um <laughs> i didn't see this so. outfit oh yeah it's very fun um <laughs> i guess I'll have to he, yeah he posted it on on his facebook and it was, oh, okay, it was quite okay. fun so um yeah hopefully he, he'll mention something about it but yeah no he's already like a quarter of the way through uh the the high peaks so um if he gives us another little snippet We'll put it here. Uh, If not, I guess we'll just, uh, we'll roll into the episode. Yeah, sounds good. Hello, everybody. Mike is here just giving you guys another update on my progress with the 46 high peaks. I am up to 13 high peaks now. Yesterday, I did Big Slide Mountain as well as Lower Wolf Jaw. That was the second one that I did yesterday. So I'm up to 13 now. And I just have to say... There is no way I'm going to be able to do all 46 this summer. I'm going to get as many as I can. I'm having a lot of fun doing it, but uh, I am in good enough shape. I am not in good enough shape to do that many mountains in this short period of time. So, but I'm still having fun. 13 down and whatever 46 minus 13 is left to go. So thank you guys. And uh, yeah, I'm with the rest of the show. So this episode today, we're going to be talking about the Carboniferous period, which is one of my personal favorite periods in geologic history. It's not one that I've really worked with, like for my thesis or anything, or I worked with it a little bit on um, my undergraduate research project, mm-hmm. but uh, it's really, I think, underrated. So many really important things happen during this time. Uh, but it kind of gets overlooked because it's very famous for one thing and the other things kind of get overlooked. So okay. but a little bit of background. <laughs> oh, what, what, what was that? I just said, okay, like I'm yeah. curious. Yeah. So a little, little bit of recap. In episode 50, we talked about the Cambrian period and when, uh, you know, animal life and, and other multicellular life really exploded in diversity and kind of got going. We talked about the Ordovician period in episode 59, where uh, the first mass extinction, uh, where there is big multicellular life. In episode 66, we talked about the Silurian period, which is mostly the recovery from that. And in episode 72, we talked about the Devonian period, really important period uh, of transition of life from the oceans onto land and, and onto the continents, uh, as well as another big mass extinction. And so as we continue through our sort of recap of all of the uh, geologic periods, now we are in the Carboniferous, which lasts from 358.9 million years ago to 298.9 million years ago. So in nice, even 60 million years. Uh, I like when the numbers work out like that. Yeah. So uh, the Devonian period, like, uh, which, like I said, came right before this. Uh, there was a big mass extinction, not quite right at the end, so, uh, but in, in the later part. And so life is still kind of recovering from that. There was a lot of glaciation that went on, and particularly in the oceans, life was not having fun. But, quick recap, like I said, of the Devonian period, tetrapods, which are vertebrates with arms and legs, uh, came from the ocean up onto land. Land plants uh, had been on land for quite a bit of time, but were really starting to take off. And like I said, that big mass extinction that life was still sort of recovering from. So getting into the Carboniferous. Sophia, what what does that sound like to you? What does the word Carboniferous sound like it means? Well, 
at first I thought you said carboniferous and I was like meat but no I think <laughs> I think this is this has to do with carbon it sure does and do you know where the word carbon comes from I don't so it is uh, I believe carbo is uh, or, or some variation of that root is Latin for coal oh okay makes sense Yep, and so, um, and for example, if you find uh, a rock or a rock unit that has lots of fossils, you would call it fossiliferous. It, uh, the suffix "iferous" means bearing, so a fossiliferous okay. rock uh, is a fossil-bearing rock. So the Carboniferous period is where, especially in northern Europe and in eastern North America, where most of our coal comes from, and we'll talk okay. about why that is. But okay. that is, like I said, that is sort of the thing that the Carboniferous is known for. Um, but, oh man, so many cool, important things happen uh, in the Carboniferous period. Cool. And so the Carboniferous is even a little weird because here in North America, um, the early and later parts of it are so distinct that you'll often hear it... Um, sort of broken up into two different periods instead of Carboniferous. So you hear the Mississippian earlier in the period and the Pennsylvanian for the later part. Uh, because the, the Pennsylvanian is when most of the coal-bearing stuff is, which makes sense. Um, you know, I now live in Pennsylvania, and there sure is a lot of coal here. And uh, and less is so there? in Mississippi. <laughs> yeah, I guess there I don't sure know is. too much about that. Yeah, especially the eastern part of Pennsylvania is very well known historically for coal. Um, hmm. But these areas, you know, also the same, you know, uh, as like all the coal in like West Virginia and Kentucky, um, that all comes from the later parts of the uh, Carboniferous period. Gotcha. So in these recap, you know, you know, period recap episodes, I usually now talk about some things about what the world in general was doing, like global climate stuff, uh, where the continents are and that kind of thing. But with, especially with the Carboniferous period, all of that stuff is so intertwined with what life was doing that I'm going to have to sort of talk about them all at the same time in order for it to make sense. Okay. And so uh, at this time, especially life was really popping off, uh, particularly life on land. <laughs> which was uh, a really, you know, fairly new thing as far as, you know, big multicellular things hanging out on land for a lot of their life or pretty, or all of their life. Um, and I'm going to start off with the big one, isn't that plants were vibing so hard. Plants were living vibing? their absolute vibing. They were <laughs> having a great time. Nice. So... Nearly the entire planet, or, you know, at least, the, you know, the continents, pretty much every part of every continent was covered in rainforest, which sounds very alien to us today. But from what we can tell, there were rainforests and swamps pretty much across the entire planet. Hmm, that's from pretty that, cool. You can probably, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's a little bit of an oversimplification to always say, you know, during this time, the whole planet was this. During this other time, the whole planet was that. But, like, it's kind of true. Obviously, there are exceptions, but for the most part, you yeah, have the entire planet just seemed to be covered in rainforest. And, you know, because of that, you can kind of infer a couple things about, about the climate. You know, rainforests need warm weather. They also need a lot of precipitation. Um and for example, uh, the global average temperature was around 10 degrees warmer than it is today, uh, Fahrenheit. And so uh, that's the average temperature. Jeez. So obviously there are places that are much warmer than that. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, things were really warm. Sea levels uh, at the beginning of the period were fairly high. Um, at, at various points, they actually got to about what they are today. And then by the end of the period, they would... Uh, go back to being not quite as high, but still fairly high, uh, about 80 meters above where they are today. Hmm. And 
Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I thought that was curious, like interesting. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll sort of touch on why <laughs> that okay. happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, at this point in, in uh, plant history, uh, seed plants were around, but not the most dominant thing. Uh, so for context, for what are seed plants today, uh, basically everything that you're thinking of as a plant is a seed plant. Uh, the only exceptions are things like mosses and ferns. Every other kind of plant you're thinking of is, is a seed plant. Hmm. Um, so the kind of plants that we're familiar with, like I said, were around, but by no means the dominant uh, groups of plants making up these giant forests. Um, the non-seed plants need water to reproduce, which if the entire world's a rainforest or a swamp, you're, you're doing pretty fine. Yeah. Vibing, you would say. Uh, they sure were. <laughs> and uh, the first sort of quote unquote forests, depending on how you define them, because there's a bunch of different definitions for that, um, show up in the Devonian period. So before this, but they really, really exploded in the Carboniferous. Things uh, that sort of helped that in include during the Carboniferous, the first significant uh, or like things like trees with like a significant amount of like wood show up. Uh, that was like first seen in like the very end of the Devonian period, but really become widespread and common uh, in the Carboniferous. And we will touch a lot more on uh, that, you know, wood becoming much more of a thing in a little bit here. Yeah. Cool. And so wood, obviously, you know, is there to give plants structure. It's what allows trees to, to grow so tall. And that was also the case here. You know, some trees, for example, um, one of the most common trees, especially in this area of, of Pennsylvania that I live, is called Lepidodendron, which means scale tree, uh, because the, their bark would form in these patterns that look like, like snake scales or something. They like overlap and are kind of oval shaped like that. And so... These trees could grow up to, you know, 150 feet tall or so. So these are not, you know, small plants at this time. Yeah. Just because they're not the same plants that we have today, they still could get really big. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and alongside Lepidodendron and its relatives, there are things like uh, tree ferns, which are more or less exactly what they sound like. Uh, just ferns, but with woody parts. They still have like the fronds, sort of like ferns, but uh, they could grow bigger and, and had some wood in them, unlike today's ferns. Uh, things like cycads, which are the, you know, early relatives. And we also, we have cycads around today as well, but um, the first sort of gymnosperms, so like pine tree uh, and spruce relatives. Wow. Um, as well as some of those uh, early pine and spruce relatives were around as well. Those are some of the seed plants. So uh, this was the like the very first around. time that we're seeing these showing up right now. Pretty much, yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. So, and and they were by no means the major parts of these forests, these like pine relatives. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, they they were around, probably stuck or you know restricted to the areas where there wasn't as much water. You know, higher up in like mountains and stuff like that, where there's just naturally going to be less water. Mm -hmm. um, so because seeds, and we'll, we'll circle back to this, you know, toward the end of the episode, but uh, seeds don't need water to reproduce typically, or at least to grow, you know, uh, seeds bring the water with you. That's sort of the whole point of a seed. Yeah. Um, so uh, they were able to sort of grow in, in places where some of these non-seed plants couldn't, and that will become very important uh, later in the episode. Spoilers. <laughs> And so, obviously, if the entire planet is covered by forest, and not, not just forest, you know, like rainforest and swamp, like, yeah, there's, you know, the Amazon's pretty big, the Congo's pretty big, even, you know, places like, you know, the northeastern U.S. that, you know, before, you know, all the Europeans got here and started cutting down all the trees, um, you know, there were still a lot of trees there, but it wasn't even close to the whole planet, you know. And so when the entire planet is covered in trees, that really changes the climate. Oh, yeah. And so 
what is, let's do a quick uh, basic bio lesson here. So in order to do photosynthesis, what needs to happen? Uh, you need to have chloroplast and you need to have sunlight. Even more simple than that, like what, what do plants bring in? Oh, oxid, carbon dioxide. There you go. Carbon Other. dioxide. <laughs> but, but more importantly for right now, what do they spit out as a result? Oxygen. Absolutely. So when your entire planet is covered in trees, oxygen in the atmosphere goes through the roof. Yeah. And so... Do you have example, like a percentage? Uh, I sure do. Yay. Do you know what modern oxygen is? Oh, I want to say like 20 to 40, maybe. So it was 21, give or yeah. take. Right? Yeah. In the Carboniferous, it was around 35%. Wow. So a, a 50% increase, more than 50% higher than it is today. Wow. And that's important for a lot of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, and most immediately uh, to the plants, is that uh, fire really likes oxygen. <laughs> if, there's, if there's more oxygen around, uh, fire spreads and, and starts a lot more easily. Yeah. And so the plants adapted to that. Um, and so they would constantly be filling themselves with water. So they needed, even, even you know, uh, reproduction aside... Um, they just needed in order to not be on fire all the time to be filling themselves constantly with water. So they would have these giant tubes of water flowing through them constantly, which becomes more important later. But that is sort of their, their fire defense system. And secondly, is that, you know, fire needs oxygen, but also animals tend to like oxygen. I, I know I do. Um, yes. And so oxygen really helps a lot of things just grow. You know, um, particularly if normally you have a hard time getting oxygen. For example, you know, most vertebrates, you know, like you and I, have some kind of active breathing system. You know, you breathe in, there is a muscle that breathes in for you. Yeah. When you breathe out, you push the air out with a muscle. Not all animals are like that. And True. the most important, yeah, exa exactly. The, the most important ones to talk about in the context of the Carboniferous are arthropods. Hooray. Yeah. So if you're afraid of spiders or bugs, you might want to fast forward a little bit. <laughs> So, but like water bugs uh, are so cute. <laughs> oh, they are. I I do really like water bugs. I don't want to be near them because they can yeah. bite. Yeah. But I think they're quite. I think they're neat from a respectable distance. Um, <laughs> and so, in uh, a group of arthropods called the Mandibulata, which is basically uh, arthropods that aren't spiders or scorpions more or less. So this includes things like your all of your insects, uh, your crustaceans, uh, and your myriapods, so your centipedes and millipedes. Uh, they don't have any kind of pump-based respiration system. It's all passive. So uh, particularly in insects and myriapods, they just have these little holes all along their body. And because Typically, they're so small, oxygen can just diffuse through those holes and spread throughout their body. Just passively, without them doing anything. Yep. Which, if, if that's how you can get away with it, that actually saves you a lot of energy. Because you don't have to be using that muscle all the time. I wish I could breathe like that. Well, there are some pretty serious downsides to it, too. Um, <laughs> okay, tell me. So... Uh, the largest insect today is, it's called the giant, I, I think it's called Weta, hmm. but it's a cricket relative from New Zealand that gets about four inches long and can be about two and a half ounces, which doesn't sound all that big, but for context, it's slightly heavier than some like small birds, like sparrows or so. 
So that's the yeah. largest insect today. And the largest things like centipedes uh, is, are the uh, giant Amazonian centipede and giant African millipede, which can both be about a foot long. So mm. not something I would want around my house, but not crazy, you know. Yeah, I just looked up this giant Weta. It's creepy looking. It, yeah, it's very creepy. It gives off a uh, Jurassic World Dominion vibes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, too, I, that definitely that crossed right, my mind too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, again, these are not things I would want to find in my house. But it wouldn't be the end of the world if I did. Yeah. But the thing, or I guess one of the main things, keeping them from getting any bigger is that you can only be so big with that kind of respiration system depending on the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. If there's more oxygen in the atmosphere, you can absorb more through passively through those holes and that will allow you to get bigger while still keeping all of your tissues oxygenated. Mm -hmm. And so when there's 35% oxygen in the atmosphere, you get some of the weird freaky stuff going on in the Carboniferous. Yeah. So arthropods in the Carboniferous grew to what we would call gigantic sizes. Some of the common ones that you'll see talked about uh, are a dragonfly relative called Meganura, which had a wingspan of about two feet. Wow. From what I could find, most dragonflies today have a wingspan of max like two inches. Wow. So this is at least like a 12 times size magnification. Yeah. There, uh, and this doesn't just apply to insects as well. Things like uh, spiders and scorpions also got bigger. Spiders in particular don't preserve super well, so we don't have a lot of good spider fossils from around this time. But there is a genus of scorpion called Pulmonoscorpius that was also around two feet long. Oh. So like a, a scorpion the size of like a cat. This period sounds like my worst nightmare. Yeah. But the big one that you'll see when you talk about, uh, you know, the giant arthropods of the Carboniferous is a genus called Arthropleura, which was a giant millipede that was around eight feet long. No, no, thank you. Yep. Yep. I'm good. And so when you have insects and, you know, other arthropods being that big, that really affects a lot of things in the ecosystem in ways that we don't really fully understand yet because that we, we can't even begin to compare that kind of ecosystem to what we have today. Yeah. And another big part of it is that, you know, vertebrates hadn't been fully established on land yet. So these arthropods pretty much had free reign, particularly the insects, because at this point, they were the only things that could fly. No vertebrates had developed the ability to fly yet. So the only things flying around at this point in time were insects. Hmm. And so this is a, a pretty direct correlation between the explosion of plants and these super gigantic sizes of arthropods. Um, but I would be... Uh, a little remiss, and I'm sure Fia would, would talk my ear off about it if I didn't mention some marine invertebrates. Thank you. Um, however, this is kind of a weird time for marine invertebrates because it's, with all the other cool stuff going on on land, there just isn't as much interesting development for the marine invertebrates. Um, it was very typical of the Paleozoic oceans. You know, I had lots of crinoids around, which are relatives of uh, starfish. Uh, the brachiopods that we've talked about previously a bunch of times on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of corals around, but not the kinds of corals that we have today. Uh, a lot of the rugosin and tabulate corals that sure look like corals, but are like they, they are technically corals, but very different structurally than the ones that we have today. We had shelled cephalopods around still and just beginning to get to some of the 
uh, ammonites that we would get later uh, after, you know, a, a few dozen million years down the line in the Mesozoic, uh, their ancient ancestors were around. So going from the more straight conical shelled uh, cephalopods to uh, beginning to have much more curled shells, as, as we've called them, these uh, swirly shelled squid boys. <laughs> Uh, Eurypterids were also having a pretty good time, and they were actually a, a good number of uh, amphibious Eurypterids. So uh, not just restricted to uh, being in the ocean, they actually could come up on land and uh, partake in some of the land things. I don't think we've seen any fully uh, terrestrial Eurypterids, but uh, we definitely have pretty good evidence of them being at least amphibious. And lastly, for the marine inverts, we have uh, the... Continued, sad, steady decline of the trilobites, uh, one oh. of the most important groups of the Paleozoic, uh, our, our little undersea Roombas. I think there's only one group of them left at this point, and they just continue to sort of dwindle for the next, you know, few dozen million years. Sad. Um, yeah, very sad. I really like trilobites. <laughs> Uh, and one fun example, actually, that I was able to look up, because I was like, okay, there's all of these invertebrates that we have on land. I'm like, there's got to be some good spiders from this time period. Everything else was big. Uh, and one that you will find if you try to look that up is uh, a genus called Megarachne, which they thought initially was a spider, but it turned out to be a Eurypterid. <laughs> And not even a particularly big Eurypterid. <laughs> it would have been gigantic for a spider, but Eurypterids, you know, could be, I think I've seen, you know, some species that could be close to 10 feet long. Oh, it's kind of cute. Yeah. Also terrifying. Oh, very terrifying. I would hate one of those like scuttling up out of the ocean to get me on the beach. No, thank you. <laughs> The pictures are very, like, uh, hot and cold. Like, some of, like, the drawings, they look, mm -hmm. like, cute. But then, like, the uh, the image, <laughs> like, 3D printed versions of them look mm -hmm. scary. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sure. So. But, as most paleontologists will be sure to tell you, invertebrates are not the only thing running around. Um, we also have vertebrates in the ocean uh they're and doing some cool stuff so we'll start with the, the ones in the water and uh chondrichthians which are the cartilaginous fish things like sharks stingrays manta rays things like that uh they became fairly common and diverse uh in the devonian and continued to be the more diverse group of fishes into the carboniferous however it wasn't the shark lineage that was more common like we have today there's actually another group uh that is still around today um, called the chimeras or sometimes called the ratfish. Uh, they, <laughs> ratfish. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, were the much more common group of, of these, uh, fish around, even though they looked very much like sharks, they were not sharks. They were more closely related to, uh, these other group of, uh, chondrichthian fish. So it was weird that like they look so much like sharks, but they have these just sort of weird limbs on them or weird appendages. Uh, very weird. If, if you want to know more, go back and listen to our episode about sharks. Uh, episode 33, I believe. 33 or 34. And we also have some other fish doing some weird things, uh, particularly also kind of backwards from today. The Sarcopterygian fish which we talked about a lot in our episode about uh, how fish learn to walk. Uh, Sarcopterygian fish are the lobe-finned fish, the ones that eventually, you know, uh, gave rise to tetrapods that came on land, as well as things like coelacanths and lungfish that we still have today. They were doing real great uh, compared to the ray-finned fish, which are most fish that we have around today. They were doing really great, uh, particularly the coelacanths. Coelacanths were really loving life at this time, despite... You know, now today only having two, maybe three species. Cool. But as with everything else in the Carboniferous, we got to we gotta talk about the land a little bit. So the Car Carboniferous was really famous for its tetrapods. Uh, previously in the Devonian period, that is, you know, very famously where 
uh, or I guess when, uh, tetrapods came onto land. You know, fish, quote unquote, grew legs and learned how to walk. And so they, those legs were made for walking. <laughs> and that's, that's just, just what they did. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. And so they, they walked right into the Carboniferous period. And uh, by the start of the Carboniferous period, uh, they had sort of centralized on a body plan of having five digits. In the Devonian, some of these tetrapods had like eight, you know, I, I think the most that I've seen for a number of digits on like a single limb was eight, but, you know, they had six, seven, eight, a huge variety of, of numbers. But by the start of the Carboniferous, they had sort of settled on five as the default number of digits. And so... Uh, Once that got sorted out, that big debate, uh, amphibians kind of went, came in all shapes and sizes at this point. Everything from small, very salamander-like things to, uh, you know, things that were meters in length, you know, six plus feet, not uncommon for members of, for example, groups of, uh, groups called the labyrinthodonts, as well as another group called the lapospondyls. The labyrinthodonts are typically considered to be the ones that would go on to uh, further evolve to be more terrestrial and would potentially give rise to things like reptiles and the ancestors of mammals, whereas the lapospondyls are more closely related to the amphibians that we have today, salamanders, frogs, and, and their relatives. Gotcha. And... Even, even though they were amphibians, they ranged in all sorts of different environments from fully aquatic. So by this point, some had even been around long enough to have developed to be fully on land and then went back to the water, much like, you know, whales or uh, things like that did. So there are some that were secondarily aquatic already. I like really the neat. thought of that because it's just like they got up on land and were like, nah, this ain't for me and went back. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh man, I, all these big bugs, I don't like it up here. Yeah. <laughs> that um, would be me. Yeah. Um, we, we had, you know, those guys, we had some semi-aquatic forms similar to like today's crocodilians, or we had ones that were fully terrestrial and basically like lizards, except they were all bound to water for reproduction. Just like all amphibians are today, they lay the jelly eggs that need to be in water. Yeah. And there's a really strange event at the very start of the Carboniferous called Romer's Gap, named after a a particular scientist who was one of the first people to notice it, where there's about 15 to 20 million years where we have really, really bad fossils of these amphibians right at the very start of the Carboniferous. So... They're there at the end of the Devonian, and then they show up again sometime around 340 million years ago. And But for that, you know, 20 or so million years in between, we don't really know what was going on. And we can have a whole episode about that later, uh, but I just wanted to point out that that exists. So there is a pretty significant gap in, you know, our knowledge of how these, you know, late Devonian amphibians got to settled that debate on five fingers and uh, started really giving us and those paleontologists looking at the old razzle dazzle with their new legs. Um, so there's a lot that we don't know about the early Carboniferous with, uh, with these guys, but a lot of proposed reasons for why, but we, we kind of don't know. But once that gap ends, uh, the terrestrial tetrapods go on to do a couple really important things uh, toward the end of the Carboniferous. So the first is the development of the amniotic egg, uh. which you you might think, wait, I don't lay eggs. Well, <laughs> it's well, you don't. Uh, you you know most mammals do not. There are there are a handful that do, uh, but. You still have all the layers, well, at least, you know, inside a woman when she is pregnant. Uh, there's all the same layers inside the, the uterus that there are in, say, a, a bird egg or, or a snake egg or something. Um, all those same layers of, of fluids are there. 
And so around the late Carboniferous, uh, similar to how plants developed seeds to be able to take water with them, uh, that is the general consensus with the you know selective pressures toward developing this amniotic egg, where it's like, well, if, if I don't need water anymore, that is a big advantage and can potentially make it so you can exploit resources that, you know, things that still need water to reproduce can't. So they started laying these leathery sealed up eggs, these Ziploc bags of eggs. Um, <laughs> uh, I like that. <laughs> and and so, thank you. I literally just came up with that off the top of my head. <laughs> it's, it's nice. Um, I like it. I'm going to use that from now on. I like okay, that. Good. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the first big one is, you know, once, even, even though there were swamps and things at this time, you know, like I said, there were areas where there weren't swamps. And if certain of things that do similar things to you that eat the same food as you that, you know, do the same thing roughly in their environment that you do, if you can go places that they can't, and your babies, therefore can go places that they can't, that inherently gives you a little bit of an advantage. Um, so that was the first big innovation that tetrapods had during the Carboniferous. And almost immediately after that, we have the first big split in uh, to, to give us the two major groups of amniotes. You know, the amniotes being the vertebrates that lay, you know, encased eggs, the Ziploc bag eggs. <laughs> and the, the split is a little complicated. We've talked about it before in The Origin of Mammals, but basically... The two main groups are the sauropsids on one side. They have more or less two holes in their skull behind their eyes for muscle attachments called temporal fenestra. They have two of them. The other group, the uh, synapsida, they have just one behind their eye for muscle attachments. The sauropsids are the ancestors of your lizards, your snakes, your crocodilians, your dinosaurs, your birds, all of the things that, you know, your turtles, all the things that typically are, are thought of as quote-unquote reptiles today. The synapsids, they are the ones that would eventually give rise to mammals. So this is where mammals and reptiles split. Okay. Which today, you know, mammals seem very weird compared to all the other groups of vertebrates around. And that's because we are, it's because we split over 300 million years ago. We're real weird. We've been apart for a long time. <laughs> and so this is, this is where that starts to happen. If you were to go back to this time and look at, you know, the earliest synapsid and the earliest sauropsid, they would look fairly similar. They would both look fairly lizardy. Um, but, you know, over time, particularly in the next one of this little mini series that we do where we talk about the Permian period, uh, that will become much more important because then they really start to differentiate from one another. But even still by the end of the Carboniferous, they still looked fairly lizard-y. Cool. So that's pretty much it for what animals were doing. But I can't talk about the Carboniferous period without talking about the coal. Because as, as bad as coal is for us to be burning right now, despite what the Supreme Court thinks. Um, uh, mad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, despite what the Supreme Court says, coal is bad to burn. But I think it's important for us to know how it got there. True. And so the Carboniferous, like I said at the very beginning, is called that because of its coal. And coal... Uh, we did an episode about fossil fuels like way, way back, like episode like 12, I think, um, about uh, generally fossil fuels. I think for the most part, that episode talked about um, like oil, but how coal forms is peat. So basically organic material, mostly from plants um, that doesn't get decomposed like it normally would, typically because it falls into a place of low oxygen, uh, like a swamp, you know, swamps though the water tends to not have a lot of oxygen for you, you know, feel free to, to jump in at any point here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, swamp water, there just is so much stuff that is, that is decomposing in it and the process of decomposition absorbs oxygen. So the water yeah. tends to just be very low in oxygen. 
um, which means that more decomposition can't happen if all the oxygen's already used up. And yeah. so this buildup of, you know, not decomposed plant material building up and building up and building up over time uh, creates peat, which then goes through several stages of, you know, you know, being buried and being, you know, slightly metamorphosed underground to compressed to become coal. As there's lots of different varieties of coal of different, you know, stages of, you know, being hard pressed, but more or less by the time it becomes coal that is, you know, recognizable as coal is pure hydrocarbons, just long chains of uh, carbons connected together with some hydrogens tagging along for the ride. And that is what we burn to create our, the various kinds of energy that we use. That's true of both coal and oil. Um, you'll learn all about that in our episode about fossil fuels. And so with the entire planet being covered in these rainforests and swamps, lots of plants were growing and then dying. And in theory, they should have been being broken down. But as we just talked about with swamps being fairly anoxic, mm -hmm. that was preventing some of that breakdown from happening. But also plants developing wood was really bad for them being broken down. Wow. Today, we have all sorts of bacteria and things that can digest the compounds that make wood, mostly lignin and uh, cellulose. But at the time, because plants had just evolved this, this had not been around before, the bacteria had not had a chance, and the bacteria and the, and the fungi that normally do it, have not had a chance to develop a way to break this down chemically yet. So even with things like, like uh, for example, Meg, um, Arthropleura, the giant millipede there, was herbivorous. It ate plants and stuff. It didn't have the ability to process all of this lignin and cellulose, so it would just poop it right back out and nothing would decompose it. Or a tree would just die and all the parts that weren't that would get decomposed, but you would have most of the tree part of the tree just left sitting there. And over time, this built up and built up and built up, and that's how we got all of this coal that we have from the Carboniferous period. So I actually kind of read that this is a little bit controversial. That I guess there was some research done in 2016 that says that that's not quite how it happened, uh, so much as the... Uh, the bacteria and fungi not being able to break it down, but I th think it s seems to make sense, you know, if that's not yeah. what the data say, it's not what the data say, but that makes sense to me at least. Yeah. And so as we get toward the end of the period, obviously the Carboniferous didn't go on forever. We don't currently have rainforests all over the planet. And that's because the Carboniferous ended somewhat dramatically. Not, you know, dramatically like a big asteroid hitting the planet or something at the end of the Cretaceous. But uh, earlier, when we talked about how high the oxygen was, you know, we talked about that you need to absorb carbon dioxide to make that oxygen. And as we sort of alluded to when talking about burning fossil fuels, uh, when you release a bunch of carbon into the atmosphere temperatures go up. If you suck a whole bunch out, temperatures go down. And so with these, all of these massive forests sucking up all of this carbon out of the atmosphere and then dying and not being decomposed and releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere, instead of releasing it like it normally would, it was just getting all buried. And so it, really sucked all the carbon out of the atmosphere and dropped temperatures very drastically at the end of the period. So life got a little too big for its britches and the, the planet kind of had to put it back in its place. Gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah. So because temperatures drop quickly, that typically also coincides with drying 
as well. Um, you know, less heat just means, you know, less evaporation, which means less rainfall and, and so on. And so all of these plants that need water, not just to reproduce, but to suck up to prevent themselves from being on fire. If they don't have that water to be in them anymore, they're just going to catch on fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so the, the forest really, really struggled just from these climatic things. And something that I have neglected up till this point is what the continents were doing. Because in the late uh, late uh, Carboniferous, Pangaea forms. Yay, Pangaea! Right. So, Gondwana, all of the southern continents, so that would be South America, Africa, Australia, Antarctica, uh, and uh, India. All of them were hanging out together in the smaller supercontinent Gondwana. They had been together for a few hundred million years by this point. They're old friends. All of the northern continents... North America, all the various parts of Europe and, and most of what is today Asia um, were hanging around together fairly recently up till that point. And they'd been together for, a, you know, a few dozen million years. But around 320 million years ago, they all of them joined forces into the continental Megazord and created Pangaea. And... Having a giant continent, you would think, would make a lot more coastline, right? You know, one yeah. big continent, that's, that's an entire super continent's worth of coastline. But it actually creates much less because now only basically one side of each continent is exposed oh, yeah. to the ocean. Okay. I was like, wait, I don't really feel like it would do that because, like, surface right. area, but... <laughs> exactly. So, it... The, your first instinct might be that it would make a very long, contiguous coastline. Oh, I but see. But the center of the supercontinent is extremely dry. Because, desert? no, yeah, it'd be pure desert. Because water from the ocean just doesn't make it that far in. Yep. And so, on top of the climatic cooling and drying all of this stuff going on with the continents, life got real, real bad for plants. Like the latest Carboniferous into the Permian period was horrible for uh, these, you know, uh, non-seed plants. And uh, it's actually been given uh, its own catchy extinction name called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. So... We might do a potential full episode going into some of the details and things about that in the future. But uh, obviously the, the plants were having a real hard time and all the things that depended on those plants, which is to say pretty much everything, was also having a pretty hard time, particularly the amphibians, because unlike the amniotes, they still also needed water and now there's just much less of it. So this left a lot of room for seed plants and amniotes to be able to diversify and do some cool things. And we will uh, get more into that once we talk about the Permian period sometime in the future. Cool. Very cool, Kevin. Well, thank you. So that wraps up the Carboniferous period. Like I said, I really like this period. This is, it has some of just the wackiest <laughs> animals around. Plus just, being on an entire planet that is a rainforest must just be cool and incredibly scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think this would be the last uh, period that I would want to go to because of the large bugs. <laughs> uh, wait until we talk about the Permian. <laughs> the Permian okay. also gets a little wacky, but okay. we'll, we'll get, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Right. Cool. So that is all I've got for this episode. Sophia, what have you got for us for Swamp Corner? Yeah, so um, I have some uh, little fun click clickbait for Swamp Corner segment this uh, this week, and that is the naked goby. Ooh, scandalous! Yeah, I know. 
Um, this is a, a type of fish, Gobiosoma bosque, and uh, it's uh, named for its lack of scales, so naked. Oh, it doesn't have scales. Okay. Yeah, um, it is technically a true goby, which means that it's part of the gen- genus Gobiosoma. I guess there's others within the family that um, aren't part of the true goby terminology. Uh, okay. They usually get about two inches in length, and they have um, pelvic fins that are linked together kind of like a membrane and it creates this sort of like suction like disc um which is used to like hang down on the bottom of uh the ocean which is the the benthos uh where i'm looking to study uh community stuff with with my project so Mm -hmm. um the bottom dwelling or benthic organism naked goby uh have been shown to feed on worms crustacean eggs, and small crustaceans like amphipods. And uh, I've seen quite a few of them in my samples. They're really cool to look at um, and just fun to talk about because they're naked. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, all so I are, have. are they native to the area? Because I know um, up where I grew up around the Great Lakes, there is some kind of goby species that is highly invasive. Um Yes, they're, they're um, doing some nasty things. Yeah, there there are some some gopies that are invasive, but these ones are are native to uh, the Gulf area. Um, they're primarily like estuary organisms, so they like brackish waters. But they're found mm-hmm. like all along the Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Mm-hmm. We uh, we we love some clickbait here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. So. Thank you for uh, for teaching us about the the Gobi's naked ways. Yep, of course. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, we now have a little bit more appreciation for the coal of North America, even if we yeah. think it should stay in the ground where it belongs. Um, <laughs> we can still appreciate so, it. Exactly. And so, thank you all for listening. We'll be back with you next week with some guests. We have a guest episode next week that I'm very excited for. Uh, and until then, we will see you all later. This episode of I Wish You Were Dead was written by Fenella Campanino and hosted by Gavin Davidson, Mike Bryson, and Fenella Campanino. It was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you. 